All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've all had some uh, amazing sessions already today. I just came out of the main session um, with what a remarkable speaker. It's impossible to follow. So um, I will just do my best for all of you to uh, provide the information that I'm here to give you. Um, my name is Jenna Vidosh. I am a graduate of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I was a mortarboard member uh, my senior year of college, um, well, my first senior year of college from 2006 to 2007. Um, I have uh, served as advisor for my chapter. Um, I just closed that, that uh, session of my life. I was advisor for almost 15 years for my chapter. So I'm very passionate about mortarboard, currently sitting on our finance committee um, to help with our um, national financial uh, matters, and still very much involved and care about what's happening with mortarboard and care about all of you. Um, I've long felt that the students that get into mortarboard are the ones that give me hope about the future because you're bright, you care, um, and you're going to do amazing things. So my only goal today is to give you more tools at your disposal to help you as you um, are approaching this next chapter of your life getting ready to graduate, um, for those of you especially that are thinking about going right into the workforce and wanting to give you um, those tools and tricks uh, to be able to be successful. Um, I'm going to try to keep my eye on the chat if there's a question or, uh, thank you, Emily. Yes, go Big Red. Um, if there's some other question or anything that pops up, please feel free to throw it in there. I'll try to check on that. Um, I want this to be helpful to you. So if there's something that I'm not covering or some topic that you need assistance with, please let me know. Um, I want to make sure we cover today the basics of investing, right? Why it's not just saving that's important. You need to invest also. So we'll talk. Um, I'm going to kind of go quickly through our rules of the road, right? That's what we talk about, these 10 rules that we have for investing to help you be successful in that arena. Um, and then also um, talk about budgeting, talk about why we shouldn't wait, right? Why we should get started today while we're young and make sure that we're making these choices um, now and start investing. So that's kind of the map we're headed on. Again, if there's questions or something pops in your mind, please feel free to throw it in the chat and I'll do my best to keep an eye on that uh, today. So I'm going to share with you um, some slides to go through talking about this concept of investing and kind of the basics of it to help you get started. So can everybody see this? Rules of the road. Can I get any thumbs up from people? Perfect. Thank you for the feedback. Um, it's still looking like... There we go. All right. So when we talk about investing, um, and again, you'll have to forgive me, I'm working from pre predetermined slides from a seminar that we have. So we'll cover what we need to out of here. Um, but really the best practices, this is what we're going to cover, of how to invest work toward your goals, avoid common mistakes that people make, um, and then use them as kind of guidelines for success as you um, begin your investing. So 10 most important rules of the road. Rule number one is develop a strategy, right? In order for you to know where you're going, you have to know where you want to go, right? You have to have a goal. So what's most important to you? That's a question I ask my clients a lot and that I encourage people to think about is what is most important to you? And then developing a strategy to be able to get there, right? So if you want to retire someday, you want to retire young, right? Investing is going to be very important for you. Um, if you want to have a second house someday or you, you have other big goals, right? Maybe you have children and you want to send them to college. Whatever your goals are, understanding what they are so that we can document them and develop a strategy. Um, I always, obviously, believe that working with an advisor can be very helpful um, to help you outline your goals. There's lots of different ways that you can pay for that advice. Um, I know a lot of people always ask me that. Um, some advisors charge hourly or charge to develop the plan for you as a flat fee. Um, other advisors charge based on commission or based on fees. So it's okay to ask questions before you do business with someone. Um, but 
that person should help you outline and prioritize your goals, help you um, with discipline, and give you guidance to be able to achieve those goals, and then revisit those regularly with you to keep you on track. Um, rule number two, understand risk. Um, whenever we talk about risk, I think we often think of volatility, right? We hear about the market being up so many hundreds of points or down so many hundreds of points in a day. What does that even mean? What kind of risk, what is that even representing as risk? So when you hear people talk about that, what they're talking about are, are the indexes, right? And I'm going to get, um, I'm going to get a little nerdy for a second because this is important to me. All, all the indexes, right, is an indication of an average of what businesses, companies are doing, right? It's, it's not gospel. It's not everything. It is not the truth, right? It's, to, it's an indication of what's happening, right? So if we talk about the Dow, right, a lot of people reference the Dow and the Dow being up or down so many hundreds of points in any given day. Um, the Dow is 30 companies very small picture of what's happening on a global scale of how many thousands of companies we have in the United States as well as abroad. Um, the S&P 500, 500 companies. Actually, I think my, maybe right now it might be 502. I've, I've lost track a little bit because they've had a couple splits. But it's, it's an indication of how those, you know, on average, what are U.S. businesses doing? Right? And then you can get indexes for international, emerging markets, for bonds. Right? There's an index for everything. Um, but that volatility of that index, right? it being up or being down, is just one type of risk. There are so many other types of risk in the market. Um, we've seen one very big risk happening in the last year with interest rates coming up. Maybe you've heard people talking about that. Maybe you've noticed on your student loan that the interest rate on the one you took out for this fall was a lot higher than you would took, took out for the fall or two before that. Um, interest rates change. That is another type of risk, right? Inflation. That's been a hot topic the last couple of years. Money sitting in cash is not growing to keep up with a rate of inflation, right? So inflation becomes a risk. Loss of purchasing power is the term that we would use for that. My dollar is worth less today than it was two years ago, and I can buy less with it. Um, so there's lots of different types of risk as you think about investing. And it is important when you think about your goals that you understand what types of risk you're choosing to accept. Um, so don't, don't get too stuck on the volatility in the stock market and, and lose sight of some of the other risks that need to be mitigated as well as you're working toward those goals. Um, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and catch a couple more of these slides. Um, diversification. So when we talk about investing, some of the most important aspects of putting a portfolio together or investing, um, especially if you've never done it before, is diversification. Right? We talked about these indexes or these different categories of the market. If you only buy one thing, then you only have the one thing. Right? If you buy an S&P 500 index fund, that's the only investment that you have. You don't have exposure to bonds, to international investments, to maybe a lot more small and mid-cap companies. And especially if you buy a true index fund, you're really a lot less diversified than you think because the actual index is cap-weighted or the size of business weighted, right? So what you're getting primarily on the results of that index is a handful of companies. Um, so truly diversification can be very, very important in being able to predict the, the full outcome of a portfolio. Stick with quality, right? Don't chase bad investments. Um, everybody, I know a lot of you have your cameras off, but maybe give me like a thumbs up on your uh, reactions. Is, did everyone hear what happened with, like, the GameStop debacle? This was maybe a year or two ago. I know you're still in college, but is everyone – yes, I'm seeing a couple thumbs up. Just a couple. So um, what, what happened with GameStop is users on Reddit, quite frankly, um, decided to all band together and drive up the price of GameStop so that – money managers, and especially like hedge fund managers that had bought some investments that more or less were predicting that GameStop would be worth less, right? 
that's the short version of what they were doing. They were hedging, buying options. Um, it gets a little complicated to get into that stuff, and I won't bore you with the details, but they essentially drove up the price of the stock artificially by all choosing to buy stock prices. Well, then other people joined in and bought the stock because it was being driven up artificially, um, only for it to crash you know, 48 hours later because there was no – there were no earnings, there was no assets, there was nothing that made that stock actually worth more other than this big social experiment that was essentially happening. So I always tell clients, be very careful about where you're hearing an idea from and be very careful if it seems like a fad idea, right? Because that's, if you get lucky and can time it, fantastic. Most people aren't that lucky. Most people got hurt buying, buying GameStop in that, in that particular example. Um, so that's why I always tell clients it's quality, not something that's a fad or that you heard on Reddit. <laughs> um, be very careful about where you're getting your financial advice. Um, investing for the long term, I always tell clients too, we're, this is a marathon, not a sprint, right? Especially as young as all of you are in your early 20s, retirement is 40 years away. Maybe less if you play your cards right and invest appropriately, but that's a really long time, right? So we're not trying to chase yield. We're not trying to time the market. We're not trying to guess anything. Um, you want to buy for the long term. Now, that doesn't mean buy and forget, right? You should review your investments and keep an eye on them. That gets into some of these other rules that come later, um, talking about, well, I'll skip, I'm skipping ahead, but talking about some of the other things that you should do as you're reviewing your portfolio, um, like rebalancing and some of those types of things. So don't forget, don't buy and forget, um, but have a, a longer term view in mind than just a day or a week. Um, so again, this talks a little bit more about diversification, right? How diversification of investments can smooth the ups and downs of the market, um, keeping our long-term perspective in mind. Having realistic expectations, right? What return do I actually need to achieve my goals? Um, do I need a 10% annual return or can I get there with five and be safer? Again, this is where working with an advisor and someone can help you develop a strategy to meet the goals that you have and determine if they're realistic. Um, again, don't count on averages and don't chase performance, right? We're always going to have years that are terrible. Like last year was a really rough year in the market. Um, you can't expect every year to be a great year. It's not a linear path. Um, maintaining the balance. So again, this I was just saying um, earlier, talking about rebalancing and making sure that you're revisiting your investments regularly, right? Don't buy and forget. Make sure that you're taking a look at them. A lot of 401ks, actually this is um, something that I really appreciate about the technology that we have today that we didn't have um, you know, back in the 90s. My dad started in this business in 1990. So I'm a second generation financial advisor. And when he started in this business, Things were a lot more difficult. Um, now we have technology, right? We have computers that help us. So when you join, for instance, and you get your first job and you have an, a chance to participate in a 401k, um, usually one of the options you'll have is to uh, let it automatically rebalance for you. Strongly encourage people to do that, right? Set it up right the first time and allow it to rebalance. Now you should revisit it often, but it, it removes a lot of the um, emotion from, oh, but the market's so bad right now, should I rebalance? Or I'm really scared right now, should I rebalance? Um, it just allows that to rebalance and allows you to be able to stay on track with your goals. So utilize technology at your disposal. Um, a lot of 401ks will also allow you to set it up to, that every year you increase a percent that you're saving. I encourage clients to do that too, right? You can set a cap, but if you say, well, I can only do what they'll match, or I can only do 3%, I can't afford it, right? We're going to talk about budgeting here in a minute, everybody's favorite B word. Um, but there are, there are tools at, at our disposal to make this easier for us, right? Easier logistically, easier emotionally to be able to manage our money in a logical manner. So let's use them, right? Let's make sure that we're um, utilizing those things. We're going to talk more about 401ks in a minute too. So if anyone has questions, um, make sure and throw them in the chat. Um, Preparing for the unexpected, 
right? I don't know how many of you have others that depend on you, a partner or a child, or maybe you have a parent or a sibling that depends on you, but making sure that you're addressing those risks, um, making sure you have enough of like a cash savings available to you as you're entering the, the real world, um, especially if you own any property or anything like that, a car or a home, um, and also life insurance. If you have a loved one that is dependent on you um, for the things that they need, right, for income or, or support, um, being able to address those things is very important as you're thinking about your future. So creating an emergency fund, like I said, thinking about insurance options and what's appropriate for you. A lot of jobs offer insurance, but you can also buy term insurance very inexpensively through like your home or auto insurance agent or probably from your financial advisor. Um, and then planning your estate. I know that's not a fun one to think about, but again, if you do have a loved one that's dependent on you, it's very wise to consider meeting with an attorney um, and having a game plan, God forbid something happened to you. Um, rule number nine, focus on what you can control, right? I actually have this on my computer screen as a reminder every day to myself. I think this is so important in so many aspects of life, right? Not just investing. Focus on what you actually have control over. You have control over saving every month for your future. You have control over how it's invested. You have control over who's helping you with it. You can't control the market. You can't control interest rates, right? You can't control any of those other things. But you can't focus on what you are able to control and try not to let your emotions about those other things you can't control drive your decisions. That's truly Truly, that is where the difference is made for people and those that are successful with investing and those that aren't. If you are able to remove your emotion from your decision making about things like your portfolio. Um, and lastly, review your strategy regularly. Um, stay on course, right? And it's more than just the investments, right? You want to go in for a regular checkup, make sure that you're, do you have enough life insurance for the people that depend on you in your life? Do you, are you saving enough for your 401k? Do you maybe have a child that you want to send to college and you want to save for college and now you have a new goal? Like whatever those goals are that creep up for you throughout your life, um, make sure that you review those things regularly and then address all of them together because all of our lives are happening all the time, right? It's not just one, one siloed moment. All of us are happening concurrently with the things that we are dealing with, right? Whether they're happy things, they're wonderful things. Maybe we got a new job or we have a partner and we're moving in together and buying a house or maybe we're having a child. Those are all wonderful things. There are hard things that happen too, um, but make sure that you're revi revisiting your strategy regularly uh, to make sure that you're staying on track for your goals that you've set out. That was a lot of information. I'm trying to get through a lot of information here in 45 minutes. Um, any questions on that before I jump into talking about budgets and 401ks and things like that? And if you do, feel free to like raise your hand. I'm happy to help unmute you, or I can drop it in the chat and I'll address it. Just wanted to take a pause for a second and make sure you're, you're all with me. What's, Leah, what's better, a 401k or a Roth IRA? That is a fantastic question, Leah. Thank you for asking that. So a couple of items on that, and this segues perfectly into us talking about 401k plans. The IRS, Department of Labor, whoever else, the powers that be, have created a couple of different categories of retirement savings. So one option that you've got in front of you, if your business has it, is something called a 401k. The 401k allows you to save directly from your paycheck, from your job. Most 401ks offer matches for you, um, and then they give you a limited amount of investments to choose from and an investment manager that you have to use to be able to participate. Um, and then a lot of 401ks now are actually offering you to save pre-tax or traditional or post-tax, or Roth. So most 401ks allow you to save both ways. I would tell you when I'm visiting with my clients and offering them advice, the first place you should save is in a 401k, especially if you're getting a match. If they're offering you free money to save for retirement, take it. 
So if they say, if you do 5%, we'll match you 3% or 4% or whatever the threshold is, I would strongly recommend that you do a budget. We're going to get to budgets here in a minute, and you figure out a way to make that work. Because there is no rate of return, no investment that's going to get you a 50 or 75 or 100% return day one on your money the way that an employer match will on a 401k. So I always encourage people to save in the 401k first. Now, if you are young, a Roth is probably the best idea. Um, and here's why. So the way that a, the old school traditional savings of 401k, all that money would be pre-tax, right? So you would not save um, after tax. So you would not owe, owe taxes, income taxes on those dollars that you would save. You would invest those dollars and then they would grow over time. They would grow tax deferred, so you're not paying taxes on the capital gains or the dividends or the interest that are being generated by those investments every single year, right? Because they're sheltered inside your 401k. And when you go to retire, if you wait till you're 59 and a half, that's a magic number that the IRS um, uses for you to be able to get money out of a retirement account without a penalty. So if you wait till you're 59 and a half, money comes out of that 401k, but it is 100% taxed. Your original contributions and the earnings, you're going to pay income tax on every dollar coming out of there. Now, what came about more recently was the Roth concept, where now you pay taxes on your income, then you fund your 401k or your Roth IRA as Roth after tax. It again grows tax deferred, just the way a traditional investment would. You wait till you're 59 and a half, now that money is coming out tax free to you, including the earnings. So the younger you are, the more time you have, the more dollars it is, right, for those to come back to you tax-free. Now, I'm going to put a couple caveats here and say, if you are going to be a high wage earner when you graduate, you really should visit with an accountant about this conversation. It might make sense for you, an accountant and a financial advisor, it might make sense for you to save some of it pre-tax to get you down under a threshold and then save the rest of it as a Roth, right? You want to have that conversation with a professional if you're going to be making $150,000, $200,000 a year or more. You would want to talk to somebody about that and come up with a specific game plan because Roth IRAs, for instance, for an individual, not a married person, an individual, if you make more than $138,000, um, your Roth ability diminishes. And if you make more than $152,000, $153,000, it goes away completely. So... That's where it's very important to seek advice um, from a professional like myself and from an accountant uh, to make sure that you're making good choices and that you have a strategy developed that fits with what's available to you at your income level. Um, I highly recommend anyone who maybe doesn't have access to a 401k or maybe their employer doesn't match or maybe you did participate at work, but you still want to save more for your goal because maybe you're ambitious and you want to be done working at 55, whatever it is. The Roth IRA absolutely makes sense. Again, you're subject to limits on how much money you're allowed to make and contribute, how much money you're allowed to put in there in the first place. Um, so that's where you want to make sure and get good advice on that. But um, absolutely, the Roth IRA is the way to go. Um, I have a PDF I've pulled up here that I wanted to show you that kind of addresses this. Let me screen share with you one second, if technology will cooperate. So this is talks a little bit about the cost of waiting. Um, so this is talking about if you fully fund an IRA or Roth IRA, as it were, right, from the question. We are assuming a few things here with this slide, so I want to make sure that we're um, all on the same page about the assumptions that are being made. Number one, um, we are assuming a 7% hypothetical rate of return, right? Here, make that a little bit bigger so we can see. We're assuming a 7% rate of return. We are assuming that you, once you start contributing, you contribute your $6,000 every year, and then at 50 and up, we take advantage of that catch-up, and that we stop at age 65. So these are the assumptions that we've made. You can see here, these are using a little bit older ages than all of you, um, but the difference in waiting and, be, and making those contributions can be astronomical. I ran the numbers for you for starting at age 25, which, again, is probably slightly older than some of you. Uh, but just to give you perspective, if you start at 25, this 986 number jumps to almost 1.3 million. 
the number I got was 1.2875. So it's powerful the younger you start, right? This is a uh, subject of compound interest. I don't know if anyone's an econ major or taken a, any finance or econ classes, right? But this is compound interest at its finest. The earlier you start, um, the longer you have for it to grow and work on your behalf. The other thing I want to remind you is do you want to pay taxes on $986,000, a million dollars, call it, or do you want to pay taxes on the original contribution, which was a whole lot lower, right? If it's $6,000 a year for, some, for 35 years, you're talking about 210000 plus the catch-up. You're talking about paying taxes on $250,000 versus a million dollars. I think it's pretty clear you would rather not pay taxes on that million bucks you had saved into your retirement account. I hope that answers your question about the Roth. Oh, Craig, thanks for joining the session. Um, I love Craig's quote. Hopefully everyone can see it in the chat. Albert Einstein purportedly said, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. I love that. Thank you. Um, any other questions? This is all very interesting. Thank you, Josh, Joshua. Thank you very much. Um, uh, hopefully it's interesting. It is important. I will tell you, even if you're not interested, if you're like, God, this girl is so boring, this is really important. So um, I can't stress enough to, like, if you remember nothing else from today, remember to participate in your 401k at work. Please participate and get the free match and to ask for help if you don't understand. Right? Ask for help from, certainly you all know some smart finance major that you are graduating with um, or a local financial advisor. Ask who your parents do business with. Ask for help if you want to learn more. Um, but please, please, please participate in the 401k. So important. Um, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about budgeting. Everybody's favorite B word. So budgeting. One of the most important things that I can stress to you as you graduate and enter the real world, right, is to understand when you get that first paycheck, first off, you're going to lose a lot more of it than you think. If anyone hasn't already gotten paychecks um, from people, but when you stack income taxes and taxes to help pay for Medicare and Social Security, plus health insurance, if you're getting health insurance from your job, plus your 401k contribution, suddenly it can seem like you're only getting 60% of what, you, what your gross pay should have been, right? 60, 65% somewhere in that neighborhood. So I always tell folks who are switching jobs or folks like yourself who are just now entering the workforce, the more you make, the more they take. Yes, Leah, that is true. <laughs> um, as you're doing this, wait for that first paycheck and see how it goes. Right? Again, as I've said, and I stand by this statement, please prioritize participating in the 401k. I would strongly recommend if you have the ability to do that from day one, just do it. Get used to not spending that money. Um, but then see how that first paycheck goes. Right? See what lands in your bank account. And then from there, figure out, okay, what do I really need to live on? I've got a couple sample budget worksheets here. Um, and I was going to actually see if I can drop this PDF in here for you too uh, to be able to save and use. But um, actually sit down and go through your budget and say, okay, here's my new job. Here's what I'm getting from my paycheck every two weeks or every month. And then here's my expenses, right? I have rent. I have food. I have my cell phone bill. I have insurance, right? It's very easy to forget things that maybe we don't pay necessarily every month. I know some people pay for their insurance a couple of months at a time, things like that. Or maybe we have a life insurance policy that we pay for once a year, something Make sure that you're thinking about all those categories. That's why I like using either um, a budget spreadsheet, like the ones that I'll show you here in a second, or even using an app. I have a lot of clients that use um, something like Mint.com or some of those other apps that actually allow you to link your bank accounts. If you're comfortable, not everyone's comfortable with this, right? Um, some, this is why some people like to make their own Excel spreadsheets at home. But for those of you that don't know any different and grew up in the digital age and they have access to everything anyway, if you want to link your bank account, your credit card, 
whatever it is that you're using to the app, the app will help you auto-categorize things. And then you can look at the app in a real shot, a real-time snapshot, and say, gosh, I've spent a lot of money you know, at Amigos after midnight this month. Maybe I should, well, you're not all from Nebraska. You don't know what Amigos is. Whatever your late night post bar food snack joint is in Nebraska, it's Amigos, or it was when I was in college. Now I think it's De Leon. Anyway, um, it helps you categorize your expenses, right? And say, where am I spending more than I want to be spending? Um, where am I maybe spending less than I thought I was spending? And I have a little bit of room in my budget to be able to spend that money somewhere else. Um, I, I'm a big believer in knowing where your money is going and you having control over that. And the only way that you do that is if you analyze it and look at it. So um, I have a couple of tools for you. I have a budget worksheet. So this is an example of one that I have sent to clients before. I feel like it's very, it's very boring to look at, but it covers a lot of things, right? Your income, but then it also covers mortgage or rent, insurance, your water or electric bill, a cell phone bill, groceries, um, medical, right? If you're, depending on how your insurance situation is working right now, um, an auto loan or auto insurance, all those types of things. It tries to remember all the categories to help you not forget something. Um, you can certainly, I again, I'm going to try and figure out if I can be smart enough to uh, figure out how to drop this in the, in the chat for all of you. Advanced sharing options. Well, if someone wants to tell me how to do that, I can try to send the PDF. Otherwise, I could just send it to um, to Ben, and he can make sure you guys have it. But if you share it with um, us, we can post it somewhere. We'll make sure that it gets out. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think it's so important to understand the money that's coming and going. Right. That's the only way that you have control, true control over your budget and over your future is knowing the money that's coming and going. So it's everyone's least favorite thing, but if you spend time on it now and understand it now, it hopefully won't come back to haunt you later. Um, and I said the word credit card earlier. I want to address that briefly as well. Credit cards are not bad. I know there's a lot of uh, outfits or other advisors or um, talking heads on TV that would maybe tell you that credit cards are bad. Credit cards are not bad. Uh, misusing a credit card can be very, very, very costly. So I would encourage you to consider a credit card to help you build credit, especially if you don't have any other credit instrument out there, right? If you haven't bought a car, if you haven't taken out a student loan, if you haven't ever um, paid rent somewhere, if you have not started building a credit portfolio, I would encourage you to consider a credit card, but I would encourage you to treat it very carefully. Um, track your expenses, only spend what you can afford, pay it off every month so you're not paying interest. Um, and that credit card can be a tool for you to get what you want, right, which is a higher credit score. Um, my credit card pays for my Starbucks habit because I get cash back. I have friends whose credit cards pay for their Christmas gifts from their cash back. I have friends whose credit cards pay for their travel from miles that they earn and points. So your credit card can be your friend if you use it correctly. Um, so please don't be afraid of the credit card. Just make sure that you're using it smartly. And that means tracking your expenses and only spending the money that you actually have so that you can pay it off every month. Does that make sense? I'm going to sound like your mom. Sorry about that. Any card you'd recommend? Um, my first credit card when I was 18, 19 was a Chase credit card. It was, a, it was whoever would let me have one, quite frankly, right? So that might be <laughs> maybe your biggest hurdle. You may need to have um, a parent co-sign to be able to get one. In a perfect world, hopefully there's someone that will trust you with $500 of credit, right? And you can start building your credit. The Discover student card, great. Discover has cash back as a student one. Awesome. I did not know that. See, I'm learning something today. Thank you, um, Amira and Leah, for sharing that information. So it sounds like Discover has a student card. Um, so look into that. That sounds like a really great option. I would encourage you to look for one that does have points. If you can't get someone that's offering points to give you a credit card, take anything. Start building your credit, and then you'll be able to get a card that offers you points and cash back so that you can get um, – Yep, another vote for Discover. So there you go. Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
be able to get a card that gives you the, that cash back and gives you those options. Any other questions on that topic? Okay, I'm going to figure out, I'm, like I said, I'm going to share with, home, uh, with National Office the budget worksheet so that if you want that later, again, there's resources to be very careful if you choose an app, choose one that's reputable, right? Do your homework. Don't just download any app and then enter all your banking information to it. Um, so be really careful of that. Um, I know some apps, and I think Discover, I do have a Discover card, and I think they have this feature as well, will auto-categorize your expenses. So um, some, some credit cards and some banks are actually already doing that as well. If you don't want to have to put it into a third-party app, it would help you um, be able to easily and more quickly categorize your expenses for a budget. That is everything I wanted to make sure we covered today, and I am impressed that I got that done under time. So we have time. If there is another like investing question or life question that you want to ask me, I am happy to answer it. Uh, Amira, HSAs. Oh, high yield savings accounts. Okay. Um, high yield savings accounts are fine if what you're saving for is a short term expense and belongs in cash. Right? So, this is where I want to make sure that we're making a distinction are we saving or are we investing? Right? Because both are appropriate and both are necessary. Right? A savings would be something that is short term. Right? You need to keep it in cash or maybe a high-yield savings, um, something that's going to be stable for you. I know a lot of people prefer you know, FDIC-insured instruments, but something that is going to be stable value. Yes, CDs and laddering them can accomplish the same thing. Um, I would tell you, though, that is not investing, and so dollars should not go there. They should not go to high-yield savings. They should not go to a CD ladder if what they're really for is your future, right? If they're for retirement, if they're for a house in 10 years, if they're for starting a business in 10 years, whatever your dream is, right? If it's that far out, it, five, 10 longer years out, it really belongs invested in the market. Shorter term savings instruments are perfect for things like emergency cash savings, right? What if you are out of work for whatever reason? Like you get laid off, maybe you get hurt or sick and you can't work, or a loved one that you care about needs care and you can't work. Having short-term disability through your job is great if your job offers it, but then also having some cash savings at the bank in a high-yield savings account, something like that, um, absolutely necessary. If you own, again, like I said, if you own property, right, a vehicle or a home, something that could have like a very big expense for a repair, um, replacing brakes or tires or having to replace a roof on your house, something like that, it is also appropriate to keep some cash savings in any of those vehicles. I have no issues with any of them, right? The key would be understand the commitment that you're making. So a lot of those high yield savings have a certain amount of days to be able to get the money back. So just make sure that you're paying attention to that. Um, make sure that you're paying attention if you buy a CD, right? I, I love the idea of laddering. We use that a lot as a strategy for clients with a short-term need. Um, and all the, ladder, the laddering means, for those that are not familiar with that term, is rather than saying, I have $10,000 and I'm going to buy a one-year CD, maybe instead of doing that, I buy four CDs for $2,500 each, and I buy one that matures at three years, at, or at three months, at six months, at nine months, and at 12 months. And now I have money coming due every 90 days in case I need it, right? But again, that's for short-term savings. That's for emergency savings. That's not for your future and investing. I hope I'm making that distinction clear. Um, do you think it's better to aggressively pay down student debt with extra money? So I've had the student loan conversation with a lot of people. Um, I would say it depends on what your long-term goals are and what your interest rate is on your student loans and if it's holding you back from achieving other things, right? So I have clients that maybe their student debt is so high and their minimum payments are so high, it's actually holding them back from buying a house. 
So in their case, they're aggressively paying it down so that they can get some of those larger loans paid off and get their minimum payments down so that they're able to buy a home. Um, I have other clients maybe who graduate from med school and are making plenty of money and they're not worried about it, right? They're able to buy a house. They're able to do the things they want. And so maybe they're not as concerned about paying down the student debt. I think it depends on your situation. It depends on your goals. Um, I, would, I would encourage you to not forego your future in order to pay down student debt. So again, I would not give up a 401k match to pay down student debt, right? If I'm being very clear for you, I would not give up saving a little bit of cash emergency savings, like a month of living expenses, right? If you're fresh out of college, you don't have anyone else depending on you but yourself, you're renting an apartment, maybe you don't need a lot of cash, right? But I would have some, right? Because stuff happens, right? We have to replace tires on our car or we have a health bill, right? Everyone gets sinus infections now and then and got to pay to go see the doctor, right? Stuff happens. I would have some cash set aside for those things. And then, yes, if, if that student loan is costing you a lot in interest or holding you back from the things that you want to do, consider paying it down, but not at the expense of your future and not at the expense of developing a safety net for yourself first. Because I don't want you to have an emergency and then charge it to a credit card. Because once you give the money back to the student loan company, you can't get it back. Um, rough estimates on recommended ratio of savings in savings accounts versus investments. So good question. Again, I hate to give you a ratio because I think it's different for everybody. And I would think about it more in terms of dollars, right? So what, what, is, what would it take for me to get to a month of living expenses in my savings account, right, if that's my safety net number, right? For a fresh out of college, this is my first big goal. I want to save a month of, of expenses. Save in your 401k first, get the free match, take the money. And then if you're saving extra, maybe you prioritize that cash savings until it's built up to that number. And now you can back off and start putting that money other places. Um, but I would think about it in terms of more of dollars and what that threshold is, what the, the goal is, and then come back, back your way into a strategy to be able to save for that. I hope that makes sense, Leah. Or whoever asked that. I'm sorry, Sarah. Um, um so this okay is, go ahead Leah this has been like a big topic around my life like mm -hmm. investing all of this so um I wanted your opinion so I was told with a Roth IRA I'm not sure because that's the one that's been going around that's why I asked about it right away but you put money in it but then don't you have to like allocate that money to certain investments within the Roth IRA and if you don't do that all it does is sit there Yes, Leah, that is absolutely correct. So when we talk about 401ks, Roth IRAs, investment accounts, that is just a bucket that we're putting our investments in. So if you put your cash in there from your paycheck, right, into a Roth IRA or a 401k, it will do nothing for you unless you tell it what to buy, right? That's why it's very important to go in when you're doing your 401k and choose your elections of what investments you want to own. It's very important if you are doing a Roth IRA and you're on your own on Fidelity or Schwab or, or whatever platform you're using, you have to choose funds. Otherwise, it will just sit there in cash. So that's where we go back to that rules of the road that we talked about, right? We talk about making sure we're diversified, making sure you own lots of different things in there and not just one thing, and making sure that it's an appropriate mix for what you want that money to do for you. Otherwise, yes, it won't earn you anything. So that's an excellent point to differentiate between the bucket we're putting the money in and what we own inside that bucket. And my second, yeah, completely. Um, do you have a recommendation of what like website, like you said, Fidelity, like what would you recommend to work through for something like that? So I would say if you're not going through your 401k, right, if you maybe don't have one or you're not eligible to participate for a year, that's a common thing that I hear is that they're a gatekeeping participation until you've been there long enough and you want to start saving now, which I think is fantastic. Um, I would encourage you to use whatever platform you're comfortable using um, I hear a lot of Fidelities, Vanguards, and I think Schwab has an online platform that's pretty easy and low cost for people doing it themselves. Um, I would tell you, you should talk to an advisor because there's a lot of us that will help people with smaller dollar amounts and help you get started in a really cost-effective way. 
Um, but if you are going to do it on your own, just be careful about the platform you're using and make sure you read about fees, how often you're, um, they're charging you and what they're charging you because some of that stuff um, – I know one – Scottrade used to be um, really bad at that, but they don't exist anymore. So, um, Or they would charge you if you didn't place enough trades frequently enough, right? And then they would charge you every time you placed a trade, $5 or whatever it was. The cost wound up mounting to be a lot more than free to do it yourself online. So just make sure you're reading the fine print. Um, on any place you go. And then considering using something like uh, goals-based or retirement date-based index funds as you're first getting started. Some of those places won't allow you to buy individual e equities if you're only buying like a share of something. So you've just got to you know, be careful what they will allow you to do. Um, but using like a target date retirement fund, a lot of 401ks have those as well allows you to get that broad diversification. And if you choose something really far out, right, for someone who isn't going to retire for another 40 years, if you choose a 2060, 2065 target retirement fund, often that will be an, a roughly appropriate mix for somebody your age. Um, but I would strongly encourage you as you build wealth, make sure you visit with an actual advisor to help you. Awesome. And my last question, um, this might be out of your ballpark, but what's your opinion on like, buying properties then like buying up uh, people buying houses and renting them out and like stuff like that for investment yeah uh, real estate can be a great investment um it can also be a money pit so i would tell you make sure if you're going to go real estate um, that you see it as a diversification tool right because putting all your eggs in the real estate basket would be the same thing as me saying i'm only going to invest in apple stock right? Or I'm only going to invest in tech, only tech companies. That's one category of the market. And it's great. Tech makes money. But there are years where tech sucks. Last year was one of those years, right? It's been rough to be in a tech company lately. And so diversification, I think, is key. I would not put all your eggs in the real estate basket. I would also say the clients that I see that are most successful with that have either hit like a, ma a massive amount of real estate and they're paying someone else to help them manage it and it's worth it, or they're able to manage those properties on their own. They have the skill set to do basic troubleshooting in a home, right? Oh, this toilet's not flushing right. Let me see if I can fix it. Or, oh, there was a, a hole in the drywall and I can patch it myself and repaint it and fix it. Um, my clients that have that basic skill set and are able to manage their own properties can usually turn a profit a lot quicker than people who are having to help, having to pay for help from the beginning. Does that make sense? Any other questions? I know I'm over time now, <laughs> 303. Um, I think my contact info, I'm in the app uh, for the conference this weekend. If you have any other questions and want to reach out to me, please feel free. I do not bill for my time. Um, so I am always happy to answer an email or hop on a phone call or something with you if you have another question like this and there's something that I can um, provide you guidance or advice on.